the Lord with the voice of triumph. If you go straight to the word of the Lord, Jeremiah 29, 1 through 11, uh, leave, reading the NLT version, uh, Jeremiah 29, 1 through 11, uh, reading the NLT version today. Uh, and we're going to read from there. And I won't be before you long, but I will deliver a word to you uh, that I believe that can help us uh, right here at Lighthouse. Uh, if we go to Jeremiah 29, 1 through 11, NLT, it says, uh, Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who had been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This was after King Jehoshaphat, the queen mother, the court officials, the other officials of Judah, and all the craftsmen and artisans had been deported from Jerusalem. He sent the letter with Elisa, a son of Shaphan, and Jamaria, son of Hilkai. When they went to Babylon uh, as King Zedekiah, ambassador to Nebuchadnezzar. This is what the letter said. This is what the Lord of heaven armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives. He has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. He says in the fifth verse, build homes and plant, plan to stay there. Yeah. Plant gardens and eat the foods they produce. Uh, marry and have children, then find spouses for them so that you can have many grandchildren. Multiply. Uh, do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. This is what the Lord of heaven armies, the God of Israel, says. Do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised and I will bring you home again. 11 verse says, for I know the plans I have for you says the Lord, they are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. If I can have a pair of hope today, I want to focus in on the fifth verse. It says, build homes and plan to stay there. Uh, plant gardens and eat the foods they produce. Marry and have children, then find spouses for them so that you may have many children. If I can skip to the seventh verse, this is the very key pericope for today. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. If I can talk to you for just a moment, I want to talk from this particular point of interest. Seeking the peace and the welfare of the city. Mm -hmm. Seeking the peace and the welfare of the city. Jill Mayer writes an excellent article titled Subconscious Mind, How to Unlock and Use Its Power. Mayer states that the subconscious mind is the powerful secondary system that runs everything in your life. Learning how to stimulate the communication between the conscious and the subconscious mind is a powerful tool on the way to success, happiness, and riches. The subconscious mind is a data bank for everything which is not in your conscious mind. It stores your beliefs, your previous experience, your memories, your skills, uh, everything that you have seen, done, or thought is also there. Nature has given humans an absolute control over the information that enters the subconscious mind through the five senses. However, this does not mean that everyone exercises this control. Even more in the majority of cases, the average person does not exercise this control. This is why so many people go through life in poverty. The method of introducing thoughts to subconscious mind is called auto-suggestion. It comprises all the self-administered stimuli, which reaches one mind through the senses, the dominating thoughts that remain in the conscious mind, the negative or positive thoughts about yourself, make their way to the subconscious mind and influence it. A thought dominates if a thrown emotion, your faith, your fear, your love, and so on, empowers it. See, my question today is what have we done with our subconscious mind towards seeking the peace and the welfare of the city? What have we done with our subconscious mind, with our thoughts 
towards seeking the peace and the welfare of our city. Do you know a rubber band, rubber band in its natural form has to have a practical application? To get the most out of a rubber band, you have to uh, apply a certain amount of force using uh, this common place example. I hope to convey the idea that we all need to face some degree of adversity in order to reach our full potential right. in this world. See, when you're on a quest to become everything that God created you to be before the world was even created, one of the most important things you can do is allow yourself to be stretched. All right. I, I'll be honest with you, part of the stress we experience is meant to push us towards the fulfillment of our potential and the accomplishments of our goals. See, however, one may wonder, why do I need to be so stressed in order to achieve my full potential? See, there are certain things that nobody can teach us, but we can learn by doing activities that push us uh, towards our limits and bring out the best in us. See, there are many people right now, as you're watching, as you're in the place right now, uh, you, 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 you're, you're in a place where uh, you, you're being pushed on every side. And it seems like things are coming towards you. It seems like things are, are bothering you. But God is preparing you for greater. God is preparing you for stronger things. God is preparing you for better in your life. And you have to be prepared oh, yes. to understand that adversity is a part of life. Psalm 7120 helps us to know this. He says, you have permitted me to experience great adversity. Oh, yes. But you will bring back to life and raise me up from the depths of the earth. See, adversities in our life are like this. We have physical adversity. We have mental adversity. We have emotional adversity. We have social adversity. We got spiritual adversity. We got financial adversity. But these adversities won't keep you from moving forward in life. These adversities are just a stepping stone towards what God wants to do in your life. Right. And you have to be willing to be open to understand when God has put you in a place where you are in the midst of an adversity, just know that he's going to bring you out of it. He's going to rise you up from where you are and bring you into your greater place. And so to begin this, 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 let's review the book of Jeremiah. Let's look at, review the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah primarily focuses on three ideas. Jeremiah shares with us to begin with the book of Jeremiah is primarily concerned with God's wrath on his people because of their apostasy, because of their false certainty, because of their ungodliness, punishment in the form of banishment. In addition to the present, Jeremiah is also concerned about the future. Uh, it's a sign that God's people can emerge from even the most dire circumstances. Perhaps the, the, the book first two things are best understood in the light of what I term the competing tensions of the prophets. The third and final major subject of this theme of, this, of the text is, is that we see that, that Jeremiah is competing with false prophets. And so now in the book of Jeremiah, we see the prophet Jeremiah presenting God's word to his people. While false prophets try to undermine him at every turn. And no time throughout the text does Jeremiah proclaim the word of God to an empty room. Rather, he is always competing with other voices, proclaiming erroneous doctrines. Uh, Walter Brueggemann, the, the, the writer of Prophetic Imagination, speaks to this through stating that the contemporary American church is so largely enculturated to the American ethos of consumerism uh, that it has little power to believe or to act. Uh, what he's saying is that we've become so consumerized uh, with everything in our life. We have put everything in our life to fit towards what we desire, but not what God wants to, us to do. And so he says that this incorporation is in some way true across the spectrum of church life, both liberal and conservative. It may not be a new situation, but it's one that seems urgent and pressing at the present time. That incorporation is true not only of the institution of the church, but also of us as persons. See, our consciousness 
has been claimed by false fields of perception and adulterous systems of language and rhetoric. And this is what we're dealing with in our world, that we're dealing with different systems that are causing us to go astray. But the internal cause of such inculturation is a loss of identity. It's a loss through the abandonment of the faith traditions. See, our consumer culture is organized against history. There is a depreciation of memory and ridicule of the hope of Jesus Christ, which means everything must be held in the now. Have you ever met somebody that they're always saying, well, I'm always thinking of what's now, but not always reflecting on what God has done for you and what God has brought you from and where God has, has delivered you from. See, some of us suffer from spiritual amnesia. Uh, we have spiritual amnesia because every form of serious authority for faith is in question. Uh, we have a question for everything that God does. Uh, but sometimes we don't allow ourselves to go through the process. Uh, and we live unauthorized lives of faith and practice unauthorized ministries. But what God wants us to do is to be able to understand that we have to stay whole and stay take hold of, of our faith. That we have to take hold of the faith that has been enriched and given to us. That within the kingdom of God, we have a, a kingdom that, 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 that develops our identity. We have something that prepares us and pushes us forward. And so the church would not have power to act or believe without this tradition that it is the task of prophetic ministry to bring the claims of the tradition and the situation into order. That we have to look at it as an interface to see what actually is going on. See, the question today is what is the church called to do in the face of the competing tensions of the prophets? See, Jeremiah shares a, a, a letter with Judah. Do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. Oh, yeah. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. See, the, re the realization of this is that we are competing with voices. Uh, we have political voices that are competing with priestly voices. We have we have, uh, have have educating voices competing with those who are actually making decisions. We have we have competing tensions between those in the church uh, because we have false prophets, and then we have those that are true. And most times, people run after the false prophets. But we have to be willing to stand on the word of God and say, "This is what the Lord has said." And so we may look to Jeremiah as a prophetic example par excellence in terms of both creativity and effectiveness in his role as a leader and a prophet. As such, he serves as an example for those who seek to change the indifferent and dismissive attitude of individuals who do not care whether they are better off than their neighbors. While Jeremiah's public and private anguish were for another reason and for another purpose, he is someone and sometimes uh, misinterpreted as a gloom and a doomed prophet. He's misinterpreted as one who is deeply unhappy. He is, he's misinterpreted as one that's crying and lamenting all day. That, that, that they made fun of Jeremiah. And there are many times in your life where you want to be made fun of. Because they may say that you you have too much of an attitude, uh, you have you you too you too you cry too much, you worry too much. But but when God has something for you, uh, he he will call you forth, and that will produce something. See, Jeremiah's crying and lamenting was just not just because of his life, but because uh, uh, but because of this, his his, his, his crying uh, was because he he he. He had a burden and a call for more. He had a burden and a call for the people of Israel. He had a burden and a call for those in Judah. That there was something greater for them to do, but they had to embrace it. And so Jeremiah shares these three phases to the seeker. He says to seek the peace of the city. He says that we have to settle in the city. That's number one. He says we have to settle in the city. Number two. We have to seek the peace of the city. 
And number three, we have to pray for the welfare of the city. We have to settle in the city. We have to seek the peace of the city. And we have to pray for the city. Settle in the city. He says, build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away. The Native Nation Institute from University of Arizona states that the way we can settle in a city where we are exiled and captive is through nation building. They say that nation building involves building institutions of, of self-government that are culturally appropriate to the nation and that are effective in addressing the nation's challenges that it involves developing the nation's capacity to make timely and strategically informed decisions about its affairs and to implement those decisions. That nation building approach understands that, that people are not merely interest groups but a governing nations confronting classic problems of human society. See, this, this scripture speaks to the reality that God is telling them, I, I, I want you to be a part of Babylon. Now, but I want you to build your own nation within Babylon, where you where you are now establishing uh, my, my will for uh, for you and also these people. That I want you to be a blessing uh, to these people. And, and and when we look at this, as we settle in our city, as we as we settle in our city, some of our people are are are, are trying to are uneasy about settling in our city. But we have to be willing to understand that we got to be your homes there. Uh, that we got to plant gardens and eat the food of the land. Uh, that we have to marry and have children and, and, and build families. And, and the key thing about building a nation is that in the kingdom, in, the, in building a nation in the kingdom, is that you have to be open to building a family. Uh, and, so, and so God uh, shares with Jeremiah this letter, and he tells him to share this letter with the people and let them know that you got to also seek the peace of the city. You got to seek the peace by doing this. Number one, you got to work for the peace and prosperity of the city where you are sent to. You may be sent to a certain business. You may be sent to a certain ministry. You may be sent to Jackson. But you never know what you're sent to unless you allow God to speak to you. And so he says that you got to, you got to seek the peace. That means we got to we got to pray against the violence. We got to pray against the sexual uh, trafficking. We got to pray against certain things that are happening in our city to to reduce the things that are causing our city to be in an uproar. The third thing is that we got to pray for the welfare of the city. He says, "Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine." Your welfare. See, the issue is that many of us are not praying for the welfare of our city. Oh, yeah. But we're praying for our personal pleasures. We, we're praying for religious advancement. But what God, God is not worried about, uh, about, about uh, your, 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 your religious advancement. God is worried about uh, how you are seeking and praying for the people oh, yeah. that are your neighbors. Are, are, are you praying for your neighbors? Are you are you seeking the peace and prosperity for your neighbors? Are you really caring about your neighbors? Mm. He says, I, I, I want you to be able to know that, 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 that the key to your welfare is by you praying for the welfare of the people around you. That your advancement, your, your increase, your elevation comes from you praying for the welfare of the homeless man. Uh, praying for the welfare of the, of, the, of, the, of the prostitute. Praying for the welfare of someone who don't have a parent and are living in an orphanage. Praying for the welfare of people that can't help themselves. Oh, yeah. He says, once you pray for the welfare of these people, uh, then you won't see the advancement of the welfare for yourself. Uh, and so he tells them, he tells them, uh, he tells them that you got to pray 
for these people. And once you pray for them, God will bring you out after a certain amount of time. God will bring you out from where you are. He'll establish you into what he's calling you to be. And But you've got to be able to humble yourself oh, yeah. and pray to God and say, God, I, I humbly come to you saying, Lord, to help me through my situation. And so, uh, Pastor Albert Tinker, a son of Mississippi, he says that, that we have to think different and reach for the greater thing. Uh, somebody just say think different and reach for the greater thing. Uh, uh, you got to be willing to understand that what is the greater thing? The greater thing is that we need to pray for the welfare of our people. Uh, we got to pray for the welfare of our city. Uh, we got to pray for the welfare of Mississippi. Uh, we got to pray for the welfare of our nation as we pray for the welfare Affair, huh? that we begin to see the advancement and the greater thing in our life happen for us. There's something greater about to happen in your life. As you pray for someone else, God is going to bless you. God is going to increase you. God is going to advance you. Right. Don McCurkley wrote this song. He says, keep your hands upon me that no evil cannot harm me. Sun, shine, and rain, sickness, and pain. God come to you. Enlarge my territory. I, I, I don't know about you, but I need God to enlarge my territory. I need him to enlarge the coast that I'm in because once he, once I pray this way, I'm expecting that enlargement is coming towards my life. That God is going to enlarge the coast, the territory that I'm in. If you need the Lord to enlarge your territory, Somebody say, Lord, enlarge my territory. Enlarge the coast and where I am. Enlarge where I'm going in my life. Enlarge where I need my faith to be strengthened, God. Lord, enlarge me. He says, he continued with this song. He said, oh, Lord, bless me. He says, bless me indeed. I, I pray for increase. I, I pray that God, I pray for increase because as I am praying, I see God an incline. I, I, I don't see one uh, that's going down, but I see an incline of the blessings flowing. That there are blessings on blessings coming towards my life. There, there is healing coming towards my life. That God, there is a, a, a greater anointing coming towards my life. And if you need God to give you a greater anointing, I need you to lift up your hands and say, Lord, Anoint me again. Move in my life. Take me to a higher level in you. Give me what you need me to be. Make me what you need me to be. Make me over again. Lord, heal my body. Lord, save my family. And once you do this, he says, he said, Lord, keep your hands upon me. Oh, yeah. So that no evil can come against me. Lord, oh, yeah. somebody say, Lord, keep your hands upon keep me. Hands, hands upon me. Woo, keep your hands upon me. That, that, that no evil can come against me. That this that this pain that I'm dealing with, this, this adversity that I'm dealing with will not stop me from where they're trying to take me. Oh, yeah. And where I'm about to go in this next place in my life. And so we got to understand. That when we get into a place oh, yes. of humbly coming before God, that when we seek the welfare and the peace of the city, that God will begin to open doors for us that we cannot see. He begins to open doors for our community to see things change, to see things improve, to see communities come together. That when we pray, things begin to happen. Oh, yes. Things begin to happen. Let us pray. True belonging only happens when we present our authentic and perfect selves to the world. Our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of our self acceptance. But true belonging doesn't require you to change who you are, it requires you to be who you are. 
Jane Fonda says is that instead of drifting along like a leaf in a river, understand who you are and how you come across the people and what kind of impact you have on the people around you and the community around you and the world so that when you go out, you can feel you have made a positive difference. I want you to think about this week, what ways can I make a difference? What ways can I change my environment? What ways can we in, in, in impact the city even more? What ways can, can I increase and improve the, the quality of my students in my classroom? What ways can my business be more apt to help in the community? What ways can I see my church move forward in this city? Pray for the welfare of the city. Seek the peace and the welfare of the city. Oh God, we come to you today thanking you. And God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for direction. We thank you for your power. We thank you that God, you're healing. Uh, and then we thank you, God, that you are a God of salvation. You are a God of expansion. And God, that you are a God of enlargement. And God, as we pray, God, we pray for our city. We pray for Jackson, God. We pray for Tougaloo, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray for our surrounding counties that God, you will cover us, that you will protect us, that God, you will keep us, that God, you, we, would, we, we pray that the hand of the enemy will not take away that which God, you have planned for us to do. But God, we pray for strength. We pray that God, you will give us the power and the stability to do that which you have called us to do in this season and in this time. And Father, we love you. We adore you. We magnify you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will get an offering in your hand, if you get an offering in your hand, I'm giving $20 today, but I would love for you to give an offering uh, sacrificially to God uh, as, we, as we sow into the word of the Lord today. I want you to give an offering uh, from, the, from the bottom of your heart. Praise the Lord. And it, it, there are various ways that you can give on the stream today uh, for Givelify and uh, uh, and PayPal, and you can give uh, by mailing to our PO box that's on the stream. But we, we 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 love to praise the Lord and give Him glory for who He is and in this place. And our, and as we uh, leave this place, we pray that God you will touch us and keep us. And as you lift up your offering in this place, Father God, we thank you uh, for the blessed gift that we are giving today. We pray that God, as we sow this gift into uh, your into this into good ground, that God you stir it up. And God, we see increase from that which we are here to see and move forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may bring it on.